I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, for our scripture reading today, verses 27 through 30. Philippians 1, and we're reading verses 27 through 30. This is God's word. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Amen. Well, at this time in our lives, there seems to be much that is uh, out of our control. Uh, We're in a time of waiting, waiting to see what happens next during this epidemic, waiting for relief from this a virus, uh, waiting for perhaps a cure, uh, a vaccine, uh, waiting upon government officials in their decisions about the economy and, uh, and, and opening up uh, life again uh, for us. Uh, we're waiting for uh, employers to, to make important decisions about our jobs and, and so forth. But there are certain things still within our control. Uh, certain things that we can uh, uh, manage ourselves and and things that we should uh, uh, still continue to pay uh, close attention to in our own lives. And and that's where we find ourselves this morning as we continue our series in Philippians, now looking at the end of chapter 1. Today we're really getting into the body of this letter. Thus far, uh, Paul has uh, shared uh, some of his uh, personal um, thoughts, uh, prayers concerning the, the church at Philippi, sharing with the, the believers there uh, where he is uh, personally. Um, he's writing to reassure them that he's okay, he's alive and well, and that they shouldn't be uh, worried about him. Uh, that's what we found uh, in, in the previous passage. Uh, they're, they're concerned about Paul and his imprisonment, but, but Paul's not that concerned about it. Uh, he knows his future is secure in Christ, and whether it's by life or by death, uh, Paul is going to honor the Lord. He's going to live for Christ. And if uh, death comes for him, and when it comes for him, that simply means more of Christ for him to enjoy. And so it's almost as if when we get to this point now, uh, Paul's saying, enough about me, uh, don't worry about me, I'm okay, and uh, let's now uh, consider your situation. Uh, he's now appealing to the, the uh, Christians at Philippi and, and sharing with them his burden for them. It, we're really now getting into why he's writing to them. He, he begins here to share his pastoral concerns for the church. Uh, these are the things they should focus on. You know, Paul's future... Uh, as he's expressed it here, is, is a bit uncertain. Um, he's in the hands of the Romans and, and kind of waiting upon them, and, and certainly for the Christians at Philippi, uh, you know, Paul's future is, is beyond their control. Uh, and, and, and so in that sense, th- those are things they can't really uh, worry about or focus on. There's nothing they can really do to change those things. They have to leave those things with God and, and uh, trust in what God will do for Paul. But now, beginning in verse 27, you know, Paul is, is focusing on things. Here are things you can do. Here are things you should focus on. And this is my concern for you. Uh, let your life be worthy of the gospel. Uh, that becomes really the, the theme message here that will continue throughout much of chapter 2 and really stands at the, the center of this uh, letter to the Philippians. Uh, they should... As, as Christians be focused on 
the things that are within their power to control, and that's their own behavior, their own actions. In other words, uh, consider your own life. He's calling the church to uh, self-examination, and that's the call to us uh, this morning uh, as uh, believers at Rose Point. As we hear this message, it's the call to self-examination. There's lots in our life that's out of our control, but our sanctification is our responsibility. And uh, our manner of life is within our power to control. Uh, That's the reminder here of verse 27. Paul is saying, um, where is your manner of life? How are you living your life? Is it worthy of the gospel? Is it consistent with the gospel? Does it fit with the gospel that you believe and profess? Are you worthy of the name Christian? And that's the question for each of us uh, hearing these words today. Am I walking worthily of the Lord? Well, there are three things here I want to uh, highlight in this text that are kind of tests for us in, in that self-examination. Three things that Paul identifies here that show a life worthy of the gospel. What does a life worthy of the gospel look like? Well, it begins there in verse 27. He goes on to say, here's what I'm looking for in you. Here's, here's what you should be concerned about. Here's what I'm looking ahead to uh, to hear of, of how you're living, how you're responding to these things that are, that are taking place in life. I want to know that you're standing firm. That's the first point this morning. A life worthy of the gospel is a life of standing firm. As he goes on to describe in verse 28, a life that's not frightened in anything. A fearless life, standing firm amid the changes, amid the uncertainties of life. The Christian is characterized by this stability, standing firm. And so that's our our first litmus test this morning as we would look at our own lives and our response to what's changing around us. We see great changes. Sweeping changes, really, just in the past month since we were last together face-to-face. Just dramatic changes have taken place here and around the world. And um, the reminder to us this morning here in God's Word is, you know, amid all of the world's changes, there are things that stand true forever. And this pandemic, this virus has not changed the truth of the gospel. And so that's why standing firm is worthy of the gospel. The gospel never changes. 2,000 years later, the gospel stands as true today as ever. Because the gospel, you see, is grounded in those historical events, those realities of 2,000 years ago when Jesus came. The gospel of Christ is, is the gospel of his life, death, and resurrection. It's the, it's the gospel of, of uh, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. It's the gospel that was declared long ago, but foretold by the prophets, who told of a a suffering servant to come, who foretold of of a sacrifice for sin, the Lamb of God who would come, when God would himself win salvation for his people. And that sacrifice has been offered. It's finished that atoning work. It's the gospel of of Jesus' resurrection on the third day, according to the scriptures, just as Jesus himself 
told his disciples on the third day he would rise again, and that happened, just as he said. Those events, dear friends, can't be changed. Those events are historical realities, truths that stand forever. And, and nothing that happens in, in all the world, nothing that's transpired in the last 2,000 years, nothing that's happening today, nothing that will happen in the future can change that truth. It's a truth that stands forever. That's the nature of the gospel. The gospel isn't, you know, first of all, your subjective experience or some feeling or some wish or desire. The gospel is about Jesus Christ who he is and what he's done. The gospel's rooted in human history. God entered into this world, the eternal God. Entered our time and space. Jesus, born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, dying on that cross outside of Jerusalem, rising on the third day, taken up into glory, coming again for us. These, these are historical truths, events, realities that, that can't be changed. This same Jesus who was taken up in, in the clouds will, will come again and appear one day at the end of the age. This is the gospel. The gospel is outside of us. The gospel is the gospel truly of Christ, as it's called here in verse 27. It's all about him, who he is and what he's done. And so for that reason, we have confidence. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of this uh, present crisis, we have confidence to stand firm and not be frightened. Fear not is God's message to us time and again. Why? Because he's our God, he's on our side, and he's demonstrated that in giving his son to us. So life worthy of the gospel begins by uh, standing firm. We, we, we remind ourselves this morning that why we're Christians is not because uh, being a Christian makes life uh, more pleasant. It's not be because uh, we're going to be happier that way, necessarily healthier. Uh, no, we, we don't know uh, what uh, the Lord may have for us uh, in, our, in, in our day, but we know this. We know what Jesus has done. We know him. We know the truths of the gospel. We know about his life, his death, his resurrection. We know that in him our sins are forgiven. In him, we have eternal life. And regardless of what the, the news brings each day, what the news tomorrow may bring, these things don't change, friends. And that's why we need uh, God's word to start our week. We need to, to soak ourselves in the scriptures and immerse ourselves in this eternal word, this timeless truth. These are the things that stand forever. This gospel can't be changed. So stand firm, friend. Stand firm in the gospel of Christ. So that's the first point. A life worthy of the gospel is a life standing firm. Secondly, to live worthy of the gospel means striving. Striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. It means one heart, one mind, one spirit. Again, looking at, at verse 27. So it's first standing and then secondly, striving. We're reminded here, uh, secondly, that uh, a life worthy of the gospel is a life of Christian unity. To live worthy of Christ means to live in fellowship with other believers. We're saved, after all, not just as individuals. It wasn't as if Jesus only died for me on the cross or only died for you. 
He died for us. It was for us and for our salvation. Through his blood shed on the cross, Jesus purchased redemption for his church. He is now the, the head of the body. We're drawn together into his family. He, he builds us up as, as living stones into a, a new temple of God. Filled by his Holy Spirit. And so we remember that our salvation is, is corporate. That it's a life lived in fellowship with other believers. Jesus is, is um, sanctifying his bride. He loved the church. He died for the church. He, he purchased his bride with his own blood. And he's, and he's now in this time sanctifying us together as his people. Together we are the bride of Christ. Joined to him by faith. And then, as a result, joined to one another. So the gospel demands Christian fellowship, Christian unity. A life worthy of the gospel necessarily means a life living together in unity. That's, it. That's Paul's desire for the Philippians. And we're going to see that this becomes uh, a theme. Uh, this is a, uh, an obvious pastoral concern. It's it's not the case at Philippi at this time that they're living in perfect harmony together. He's, he's going to point out that, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the problems here that need to be addressed by the church. This, this is an area in, in which they need to grow. They need to grow together, side by side. There's only one Jesus. There's only one gospel. There's, uh, there's one faith. And, and because there's, there's one Lord of the church, there, there should be this unity that characterizes those who profess his name. Is Christ divided? Paul would ask the, the Corinthians, and, and that's, uh, that, that's uh, a concern here in, in, in Philippians as well. It's a concern in every church. The, the language here is, a, is strong. The word he uses, striving, it comes from um, the world of athletics. And that helps us illustrate this point, striving side by side. Expending ourselves. It, you think of the athlete in training to train the body to strengthen the body, all of the, the, the pain that, that comes to that athlete, exerting all his strength, expending his energy, striving in that pursuit. And, and that's, that's the word that's used here, and, and, and nothing less is in view. This kind of strenuous effort is required. Why? It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easily to, to live together side by side with one spirit, one mind in, in the church. It, we're, uh, we're sinners who by nature are uh, self-centered, selfish, looking out for our own interests. And when you bring sinners together, it, it's going to be a struggle to live together harmoniously in unity it requires striving. We have to work for peace, to enjoy it. It's, it's not going to just come naturally to us. You bring two sinners together, it's a struggle. You bring, in my family, it's eight sinners together trying to live peacefully under one roof. It's a daily challenge, isn't it? And, and so it is in the church. We come together as the, the body of Christ. We have to strive together for 
the gospel. We have to, to consciously pursue unity, this, this single-mindedness. It begins by, by looking to Christ. We, we remember here what brings us together in the first place, the gospel that's touched each of our hearts, that the Jesus who's, who's saved each of us from our sins, that, that good news that's come to each of our, into each of our lives. Now it's brought us together as a worshiping community. And as we serve together, we need that mind of Christ to control us. You see what Paul's doing here at the end of chapter 1. He's setting the stage for what we're going to see uh, more clearly in chapter 2. The mind that we need, the one mind that should fill the church is the mind of Jesus himself. The one who came to serve, who humbled himself who looked out for the interests of others. That's the mind that should fill the church. And especially uh, at this time, we, we need this reminder. Striving side by side. Well, we say we're not side by side. We haven't been side by side as a church for, for over a month now. But what he's describing here is not uh, just a, a, a physical reality of, of just being side by side in the same location, physically present together. We know from experience that sometimes we can be physically side by side, but not necessarily together in heart. And that's the real key here. With one mind, striving side by side for the gospel. This begins at the heart level, this unity this fellowship. And, and so it's something we must still pursue, even in this time apart, and, and especially in this time apart. We need to take the extra effort and expend ourselves and exert ourselves to pursue this unity and, and fellowship. We maybe uh, need to be honest with ourselves at this time. Maybe for some of us, this time of isolation being locked up in our homes, maybe this appeals to some of us. Maybe you deep down kind of like it this way. You don't have to bother with anybody else in your life. You can just be by yourself and completely consumed with yourself, focused on yourself. Maybe that's what you're doing right now. You need to break out of that. Don't give in to self-centeredness. Don't use this uh, pandemic as an excuse for selfishness. Think about your brothers and sisters. What can you do today? Maybe you, as, as part of the Lord's Day, you need to make a phone call today. Maybe you need to write an email. Maybe you need to send a, a text message. Maybe you need to reach out to brothers and sisters and, and say, I'm thinking about you. Maybe you need to get down on your knees and, and, and pray for your church family. With one mind striving side by side. Reach out. We're trying as a church to provide opportunities for continued fellowship, even apart while we're, we're not physically together. We can still come together with that Unity of mind, that unity of heart. The Holy Spirit is still working even in this present time. His Spirit is still with us. And I urge you not to forget that, that fellowship. The gospel demands this. A life worthy of the gospel of Christ is a life of Christian fellowship and unity. We are saved together as the bride of Christ, his church. He brings us together by his spirit and calls us to live together and strive side by side for the faith. Well, that leads us to our third and final point this morning. Life worthy of the gospel entails standing, standing firm, fearless. Secondly, striving side by side with one mind. 
And then thirdly, it means suffering for his sake. Verse 29. A life worthy of the gospel necessarily requires some form of suffering. There's no other way for the Christian. Paul makes that very plain here in verse 29. The the language here is stunning. Notice what he says here in verse 29. It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Granted, that is gifted to you. And Paul connects here faith with suffering. He says the same God who gave you faith in Jesus, that that faith which is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast, that faith that's the gift of God, granted to you by God, that same God who gives you faith is is the God who gives you suffering, O Christian. He's given you both. Paul's saying here in verse 29, you you can't have the faith without the suffering. The two come together. It's a package, like it or not. It has been gifted to you. This is God's gift. For the sake of Christ, you should not only believe, not only have the faith, but also have the, the privilege, not only being a believer, but having a privilege of being a sufferer. For the sake of Christ. This transforms our view of suffering. You see, for the Christian, our attitude is not, well, I need to escape the suffering and somehow uh, avoid it at all costs. Our expectation for this life shouldn't be uh, that we, we want to get through life free of any kind of suffering or adversity. Rather, as it, is, we're guided by God's word here, Especially here in verse 29, we see that suffering is something we need to accept and embrace and see it as a gift of God, just as we see our faith as a gift of God. Now, what kind of suffering is in view here? Now, certainly in, in Paul's case, what he was presently experiencing was a persecution for the sake of Christ, he was a prisoner because he was a preacher of the gospel. And so he faced that persecution. He faced enemies who wanted to silence him and uh, who hated the, the message he was preaching. And, uh, and that was the, the form of suffering that um, he faced, especially in his life. And, and many of the early Christians faced that same kind of persecution. And like Paul would ultimately lose their lives for the faith, persecuted to the point of death for the sake of Jesus. That may not be um, our uh, suffering that we face, and and it doesn't um, mean that this verse doesn't uh, apply to us. What he describes here is more general in nature. He's not limiting this just to persecution for the sake of Christ. It's it's suffering, something more general that it, it applies to every believer. And we can thank God we live in a, a land of, of many freedoms, the, the, the freedom to, to worship and the, the freedom to, to preach the gospel. And, we're, and I'm not facing a threat today to, to be locked up uh, simply for preaching about Jesus. But doesn't mean our lives are free of suffering. You know, we're keenly aware right now of, of suffering that we're facing. And I think it's fair to extend this verse to any suffering, any, any adversity, any obstacle to, to living that life of faith, any, any danger that would, that would threaten us, that would, that would challenge and test our Christian profession. We call Jesus our Lord. We, we see him as our, as our Savior, our Deliverer. And then and then we face adversities. We suffer and, and we wonder why. We're trying to live faithfully. As we saw earlier in Psalm 101, we want to live a blameless life. We want to honor the Lord. We want that integrity of heart. That's our heart's desire. We want to please God. We want to live a holy life devoted to him. 
Why is he bringing these things into our lives? Why does he bring illness? Why does he bring unemployment? And a whole host of um, adversities. All of this is suffering for his sake. Viewed in that light, all, all of these things can be viewed as, as suffering for the sake of Christ. In spite of the adversity, in spite of the hardship, in spite of what I'm facing, now I want to live for Jesus. And that's what we can say today, I hope, each of us. We can say that in spite of this pandemic, I want to live for Christ. I want to honor him. In spite of the obstacles. And that's the good news to us. You see that we, we can embrace this as Paul embraces this suffering as a gift of God. It's for our good. It's necessary for our salvation, the scripture teaches. God is in the details. You see, God has given us, in the big picture of things, he's given us this present pandemic. He's given it to us for our ultimate good. Paul would preach Acts 14, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. He would teach this in the book of Romans, that it's the, the, the suffering we face that, that produces the character, that produces the, the, the godliness. He's preparing us through these present groanings for that glorious future that awaits us. And that's the, the, the message here of Philippians 1. Through this present suffering, God's preparing us for glory. We're to embrace these trials and tribulations as gifts of God for our sanctification. As we respond to them, we want to see how is God using this to make me more like Jesus. That's why a life worthy of the gospel requires suffering. That's the way it was for our master. A servant is not above his master. We're, as followers of Jesus, we're walking the same path. In his steps, the path that took him first to the cross, first through humiliation, then the exaltation. That's the pattern for us, dear friend. And that's the hope we have in the face of this present suffering. God has a purpose in it, a clear plan and design for the trials he sends into our lives. He's preparing us for glory. The groaning will give way to perfection, to heaven. The suffering will not continue forever. Let's embrace these present trials for the sake of Jesus as things given to us by God. Produce the kind of character that he's looking for in each of our lives. Let's pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We remember today the gospel that stands true for all time. Help us to stand firm today. We thank you that you've called us together in this Christian life as a church. Help us today to remember one another and strive together for unity of mind as we, as we seek to serve you. And help us to embrace suffering ultimately as a gift from your wise and loving hands. We pray that the trials we're facing at present would produce in us character, produce in us endurance, produce in us godliness. We ask in Jesus' name.